Hi, welcome to Mad Scientist Barbecue. I'm Jeremy Yoder, and today we're going to show you how to make some pork ribs. Now, I went to the local supermarket. I picked up some ribs, nothing special about them, just some loin back ribs or baby back ribs. We'll get these seasoned up and we'll get them on the cooker, and we'll take you along for every step of the way. <laughs> going to be doing is we're going to trim off some of this extra meat and things like this that are just going to burn up on the cooker and uh, we just want to get rid of all that stuff that we don't want to eat in the end so we'll start getting rid of those now and actually on this one I got this tiny little bone and it's actually kind of showing through the top of the meat there so instead of dealing with a bone that's just going to burn up and not be any good to eat I'm just going to take that whole bone off so I'll just start here work my way down We'll just cut it all the way through the other side, trim off this little piece, and boom, this is going to go in the garbage. Now, other parts of this look pretty good. There's a little chunk here I'm going to get rid of, but other than that, really, this looks pretty good. Some people take a lot of time to trim off fat on ribs. You can if you want to. I haven't noticed that it makes much of a difference at all. So I generally just leave it on there, or if I do trim it off, it's only the tiniest bit. And that's just because I'm looking for something to trim, you know? It's not really necessary at all. Now if the meat here were really thick, and this bone weren't showing through, then I'd say, oh, just trim off that little chunk of meat right there, some of this fat, just, just trim it up nicely so it won't burn. But because this last piece is so thin, I'm just gonna have to take off that whole bone, just like on the other rack. They're called loin back ribs or baby back ribs. And a lot of people think that means it's just because they're smaller or not as meaty as spare ribs. But the real reason is it's where it's located on the animal. These ribs are located from higher up on the animal, so they have a bigger curve in the ribs, whereas spare ribs usually lie pretty much flat. And so if you think about it on your own body, you have the ribs on the side that are pretty straight, and then as you go up and around toward your back, the rib cage turns a lot. And it's a similar thing with pigs, except the side is pretty straight, and as you go up toward the back, it curves a lot more. Now, the meat underneath these ribs is actually very valuable. And so, when people are processing pork, they try to spare as much of that meat as they can. And for that reason, these are often the cut of meat that suffer because they're trying to make the most of another cut of meat. I think we're ready to get rocking on this. After we've gotten those off, we can remove what's called the membrane on the back of the ribs. So if you look at the back of the ribs, there's this really slippery, kind of shiny exterior to the back of the ribs that's not present on the front where it's just meat. So on the back here, what we've got is this membrane. And so, all I'm going to do to remove it, it's pretty simple, is I'm going to take a butter knife and slide it under the membrane here, and I'm going to take the butter knife and just start to work it up off of the bone. So you can kind of get in there with your hand and, and tear it off a little bit. And then, to make it a lot easier on yourself, you can use a paper towel. Just grab a paper towel because then it won't slip. You have a hold of the membrane. The membrane's still right there. You grab a hold of that membrane. And then, with my knife, I'm just going to hold this steady, and I'm going to pull the membrane off. If you're really lucky, it all comes off in one piece. If you're not so lucky, it might take you a while, and you're going to have to work really hard at it. But this one is working pretty well. Can't complain about it. I spoke too soon. So we've gotten almost all the membrane off. There's a tiny little bit here. If you were in a competition, maybe you'd stress about that and try to get little chunks of membrane off there. But really, for my purpose, for dinner tonight, it's not important. It's not going to make a huge difference. And when you're cooking at home, you're not cooking competition barbecue. You're cooking good eating barbecue. And you don't have to worry too much about a lot of the stuff that people do in competitions. So for this, we're going to do the exact same thing. I'm gonna get under here with a knife, get under that membrane right here at the bone, and try to work my knife under there. Okay, just try to lift up the membrane as you go. 
Don't do too hard or else you'll tear it and then you're going to have a hard, hard time getting it off. That'll be a struggle and you don't want to do that. Okay, so if you can get the membrane all the way across, then it'll probably be a lot easier to remove it. So on this, this rack of ribs, you can do the exact same as the other. And just take it off. This one looks pretty good. It's coming off in one big chunk. And that is how you remove the membrane on your ribs. Now if you're cooking a hundred racks of ribs or something like that, what you can do is instead of taking off the membrane, which is usually a lot of work, is take a, a sharp knife and score the membrane. That is, go several stripes in one direction and then go along a direction that's perpendicular to that and make little hash marks. And that way the the membrane on the back of the rib doesn't stop you from getting a, a tender bite of rib. And so if you're in competition, of course you would take the membrane off. That's something that everybody who competes does. But if you're at home, it's not essential, it's not a huge deal, but it will help you have a little bit more tender rib. Now after we've gotten these trimmed up, I'm going to rinse them off. And so I'm just going to try and clean up any blood that's on the outside or any bone shards from the, the plant where they were uh, processed. I'm just trying to get it nice and clean, don't want anything gross on the outside of the ribs. So I'm going to turn the water on right now and rinse them off. Now that they've been rinsed off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some pork seasoning here that I have. It's just a, a pretty common dry rub. It's a recipe I made here. It's got things like brown sugar, white sugar, it's got paprika, a little bit of cayenne pepper, some garlic, some onion, and things like that. You can find rib rubs at your local supermarket. You could find all kinds of name brands there. Uh, you can order it online or at a local barbecue appliance store. But really what I find I like the best is to make my own at home because the ingredients are pretty darn cheap and you can adjust it however you like it best. And so that's what I have here today. I just put it in an old taco seasoning container so it makes it easier to spread around. So I'm going to take it and start spreading over the top. So the benefit of putting it in a shaker is that you can kind of get an even dusting instead of trying to do it by hand which is pretty difficult. Now. One thing I will say is that I've washed my hands, I've gotten help from somebody to soap me up and wash my hands since I rinsed these ribs off because I don't want to contaminate everything in my kitchen. I've seen a lot of barbecue videos where people are touching both hands on their meat and then they grab their rub and they start sprinkling it on without realizing that what they've done is they've contaminated that container and they're spreading potentially harmful bacteria all over their kitchen or all over their barbecue trailer and that's not something you want to do. Alright, so I've used basically all of the rub I had there. A lot of times people will look on the internet and the line basically goes like this. Now what you gotta do is you gotta get you some just yellow ballpark mustard. You squeeze it all over the top of your ribs and on the back side and you get your, you get your rub and throw it on there. It's gonna help your rub stick. It's just a binder. It ain't gonna flavor your meat at all. Now, I have tried that. Um, it's kind of an urban myth, I think. In my experience, most of the rub that sticks on because of the mustard that you added, it does help more stick on initially, but in my experience, most of the rub that sticks on right at the beginning falls off by the end of the cook. So you're adding more rub when you wrap it, if you wrap your ribs, and it just doesn't really seem to be an effective tool. You could use something, it certainly won't hurt it, you could use yellow mustard or olive oil or even water, it's not the end of the world if you don't use something like that. And I find just for simplicity's sake, I don't want to bother with any of that. I'll just throw some dry rub on there that I really like, throw them on the cooker, and when they're done, they're done. So now that we've got these ribs rubbed down, I'm going to take them outside and throw them on the smoker. So I'm going to open up the smoker here, and I'm going to take these racks of ribs. Set them on here, way back here probably. It'll be the safest place for them. And after we get them situated, we'll close it up. We'll be good to go. But one more thing I'm gonna do, I've got a chunk of cherry wood here. And so meat absorbs the most smoke when it's cool and when it's wet, which is exactly what those ribs are right now. So I'm gonna take some cherry wood here, throw it on my fire, 
if I can, throw it on my fire and get to smoking. What you can see right now is the smoke is clear, right? And then it's going to start picking up more and more and more that you can see. And then eventually it's going to get a little white, but then it should, once it really gets going well, it should kind of fade away into like a thin, almost transparent smoke. But what you don't ever want is billowing white smoke, tons and tons of white smoke. That means that your fire is burning dirty, which means that the wood isn't burning well, it's not burning completely, and it's producing off flavors and off chemicals. Because the hotter the fire, the smaller the particles are that it makes. And so if the particles are really big, which means a cold fire, that's going to be thick, billowing white smoke. If the particles are small, which means hot, efficient, good fire, then it's going to be almost completely clear. And you can see here that there's only a tiny, tiny bit of smoke that's coming up through there. And that's exactly what you want. Those are good flavors. It means you have an efficient fire. You're not choking it off and depriving it of oxygen. And you're going to have really good tasting meat. So we're going to be cooking these ribs today at our go-to temperature of 275. You can cook them from anywhere around, you know, 225 degrees up to 275. I want to eat them sooner rather than later. So I cook them at 275 and we're going to let it roll here for maybe four or five hours. We've been cooking now for about two and a half hours, just a little bit more than that. And so the ribs already have a lot of good smoke on them. They already have a good color on them. And so at this point, I want to get them tender because everybody likes fall off the bone ribs. Now for competitions, people want to have a rib that you can bite through and it leaves a teeth mark, right? A perfect piece that got torn out. Um, if you're cooking for your friends or your family, they will not be disappointed at all if you take a bite of the ribs and they start falling apart, okay? That isn't to say you should severely overcook them, but err on the side of too tender rather than too firm while you're cooking them. And so we're gonna get these tender, we're gonna wrap them in aluminum foil. Now, a lot of competition cooks get really elaborate with what they put in the foil. They'll use squeezed margarine, they'll use brown sugar, they'll use honey or agave, they'll use more rub, they'll use apple cider vinegar or water or hot sauce or whatever they want. For me, a lot of that stuff is really unnecessary. Now if you want to put a little butter in there, yeah, by all means do it. Or if you want to put some apple cider vinegar in there, then that's a great idea too. But what's happening is we're basting the meat, right? We're going to wrap it up so it doesn't lose any water and cool. Just like if somebody is sweating, the water evaporates and they cool down. The same thing happens to meat when you're cooking it. And so to prevent that from happening, we're going to wrap it up in the foil so it can't lose any water. And we're going to speed up the cooking process. And it's got two layers of foil here. And I'm going to pull out these ribs and hopefully I don't burn my hands too badly. And we're going to wrap them up and uh, throw them back on the cooker for probably another two hours or so. Or until they get tender. You can open them up and if you start lifting them up and they're starting to break a little bit, that's a good sign that they're, that they're done. You don't want them to completely fall apart because those are going to be difficult to cut and eat. But... Let's get to it. So here we're using aluminium, which is a great, great wrapping tool for which there is no substitute. I must say that this is a superb product, especially this wrap I got from my local grocery store, and I highly recommend using it. Look at those juices.
So at this point, we pulled these ribs off the smoker. We've been cooking them at 275 the whole time. It's been two and a half hours since we wrapped these ribs. So about five hours total, just a hair over five hours. And so let's open them up. Oh, they look great. And let's see if they're Oh yeah, they're super tender. I want you to look at this juice right here. Now I didn't wrap these and add anything. I didn't add any agave or any honey or any brown sugar or any apple cider vinegar or anything like that. This is just the juice that came out of these ribs. Um, and if you're cooking for your family at home, which is exactly what I want to show you how to do in this video, um, this is perfect. You don't want to add a bunch of stuff that's going to distract from just the flavor of the pork. What you want is a great pork flavor accented by the seasonings that you used and a fall apart texture that's just gonna, you know, wow all of your friends, all of your family, they're gonna love it. Um, I'm gonna come back in about 20 minutes. Um, I'm gonna let these guys rest for a total of about 30 minutes, just loosely wrapped in foil. And that way they're not so screaming hot when I cut them that they, you know, lose a lot of moisture. But I'll wrap them up. Uh, loosely and we'll come back in a couple minutes and try them out and see how they turned out. So we're ready to cut these up so I'm gonna get in here and cut a couple of these ribs out. Let's give it a shot. Oh yeah, that's good. That's really good. Not too sweet like a competition rib. It's just savory and delicious. Exactly what you want to serve to your friends and family. Keep it simple. Don't get crazy with all kinds of competition stuff you may have seen online. Don't add tons and tons of sugar and all kinds of rub. Honestly, for your friends, you want to keep it simple. They'll taste the pork, they'll taste the seasoning, and they will love you for it. Mmm, this is great. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for watching Mad Scientist Barbecue. Please subscribe below and you'll learn a lot more recipes and a lot more techniques on how to make great barbecue. I think Mad Scientist Barbecue is going to help fight the war on terror, help fight Al Qaeda. Now, I feel your pain. You want to subscribe to Mad Scientist Barbecue, but you can't. Mad Scientist Barbecue is better than any barbecue in Arkansas. Now, from President Obama, I have to say, I think that Mad Scientist Barbecue is the best barbecue around.